I'm a guy in my mid 20s living in the US. This happened a few months ago. And I'd like to share it now. About a year ago, I decided to quit my corporate job of several years. Long story short, I was absolutely miserable. And I needed a serious change. So I dipped into my savings packed up only my most necessary belongings and moved from my hometown on the East Coast to another city some 2000 miles away. An impulsive decision for sure, but one I don't regret. My first month, I spluttered through a series of odd jobs, casually drifting from one gig to another as I tried to figure out what I really wanted out of life. Eventually, an acquaintance suggested I try bartending. At the time, I had no experience at all, but I thought, screw it, why not put myself out there? It couldn't hurt. I'm gay, and I applied to all the LGBT bars in town. I figured that a job at one of these places would be a good way to integrate myself into the community, maybe even meet some guys without having to resort to Grindr and the like. I quickly hit it off with the owner of the neighborhood pub, and he hired me on the spot, promising to mentor me in all things booze related. The following months were some of the best of my life. I met a lot of good people and gained a lot of perspective. I'm now starting grad school, but I still work at the same bar a couple of nights a week. That's where the following incident occurred a few months ago. I should mention that this bar is on the corner of a main road and a quiet side street. Around 4.45 p.m., I parked my car halfway down the side street, which at the time was lined with cars, and I walked back to the pub. After taking some deep breaths and doing some quick mental prep, despite the nature of the job, I am a dyed in the wool introvert, and I walked through the front door, tossed my car keys into my knapsack, and put my knapsack over the main bar. It's my routine, it's what I always do. Only bartenders are ever allowed behind the bar, and I've never felt I needed to lock my personal belongings in the back office. It's just not that kind of place. Almost all of the patrons are quality people, hard workers, community members, younger, older, and everything in between. People who generally deserve a break every now and then, if only in the form of a cocktail or three. That being said, it's not cheers. Admittedly, this job has made me wise to what so many women must have to endure on a regular basis. Not everyone is respectful of personal boundaries, especially when you're fresh, new meat. I've been leered at, and I've had guys reach out to me and run their hands through my hair, stroke my chest and squeeze things, forcefully pull me closer and whisper me all the things they'd like to do to me, only to get righteous and angry when I don't enthusiastically reciprocate. My first week, my boss told me half jokingly, this is a gay bar, there's no such thing as harassment. Yeah, I guess because they're dudes and I'm a dude and we're all dudes, I'm supposed to man up and deal with it, which for the most part I did. The money's consistently good, but I still can't say that I'm entirely comfortable with it. Double standards suck. Anyway, Monday evening can be hit or miss. That one Monday was a miss. By the time 10 p.m. rolled around, only a couple of folks remained. That's when Vern walked in. I'd guessed that Vern was in his mid to late thirties, solid build, clean shaver, and average looking, sort of impeccably anonymous. I'd never seen him before. He sat down at the end of the counter on the very last stall, next to where I enter and exit from behind the bar and where I usually leave my belongings. He ordered a soda and introduced himself and we made small talk for a few minutes. He seemed to be a pretty affable guy and nothing about him seemed explicitly out the ordinary, but admittedly something about him didn't sit quite right with me. He almost seemed a little too ordinary, like conspicuously so. He was dressed up as dressed down, if that makes any sense. It's hard to describe. Think along the lines of someone who might spend an hour trying to style the perfect bedhead. Anyway. At some point, the topic got around to video games, which I love. And then for a good 10 minutes, we discussed some upcoming releases we were both apparently excited about. Eventually, I had to excuse myself to help another customer, as well as finish a couple of other tasks that still need doing. But Vern said it was no big deal, 
and of course I needed to do my job. Cool, no problem. As I walked around the pub cleaning this and that, I couldn't help but notice that whenever I happened to look in Vern's direction, he was already staring at me. This is something I've gotten used to as a bartender, but again, something in particular just didn't sit quite right. Sometimes he would look away, but most of the time he wouldn't give me any tiny impenetrable smile. This went on for a while, nearly two hours. I'd walk up to him occasionally, ask him if he needed anything, and we'd have a brief exchange and I'd go back to my other duties. He just kept on staring, so on and so on. In all that time, he only ordered one more soda and he didn't talk to anyone else. He had his smartphone on the counter in front of him, but I never saw him once look at it. As I said before, I've experienced worse. So I figured that he was probably socially awkward or maybe just lonely. Whatever he was, he wasn't particularly subtle. By midnight, Verm was the only person sitting at the bar. There were two guys playing pool in the back room and out of sight, and a few guys smoking on the patio. But Vern and I were the only ones in the main room. In that sort of situation, I'd feel rude to not chat up the only person left in the vicinity. It's part of my job to make people feel welcome after all. But despite it being a super slow night, I felt drained and just couldn't find the energy to strike up a genuine conversation with someone who was making me feel like I was on full display. I figured it would be a good time to go to the storeroom and grab a few cases of beer that I had to restock soon anyway. I excused myself and told Vern I was going to the office and would be right back. When I made it inside the office, I immediately felt a sense of relief, like I'd finally made it backstage after a gruelingly long performance. It took me about 30 seconds to grab the stuff I needed, but I decided to sit down and mess around on my phone for a few minutes, enjoying my solitude. I stayed there until I felt like I'd been away from my post for a bit too long, at which point I headed upstairs to the bar. To my surprise, Vern was gone by the time I got back, and there was a $20 bill under his glass. I felt suddenly guilty, not because I'd just made money off him, though of course that was appreciated, but because maybe he really was just some closeted dude who didn't know how to interact with other guys and maybe the money was his only reliable way of expressing gratitude for the company. Maybe I had misread the cues and was projecting my own insecurities onto his admittedly awkward behavior. In any case, he was gone now, and I still had more to do, so I placed the cash in my tip jar and mentally thanked him for it, and I began going about my tasks for the rest of the shift and quickly put Vern out my head. A few hours later, around 1 a.m., I escorted the final stragglers outside and closed the front door. I work alone on Monday nights, so it usually takes me a little less than an hour to finish my tasks after closing. As per usual, I put on some chill music and went on autopilot. At 2 a.m., everything was done, and after turning off the last few lights, I grabbed my knapsack, set the alarm and headed out the front door, which locks on its own. I started to amble down the street towards my car, the only one left on the block, and all I could think about was how badly I needed to pack a bowl and jump in the shower. When I reached the back door of my car, I absentmindedly yanked it open and threw my knapsack in the back seat, slamming the door closed, and stepped up to the driver's side door and pulled the handle and climbed inside. Only as my ass made contact with the seat, and I reached my hands towards the open door, did I realize I hadn't taken my car keys out my bag? I never actually unlocked my car. A wave rolled over me like I had jumped into the ocean and saw something in the periphery of my vision. And I kid you not, he was there just sitting in my passenger seat. I'm not ashamed to admit that I screamed. The driver's side door was still wide open, but I couldn't move. I just stared at him dumbfounded. Sorry. I didn't mean to scare you, Vern said. I didn't immediately respond, so he quickly followed up with, I thought we could hang out, maybe play some games together. Then, like it was nothing, he handed me my car keys, which he had obviously stolen out my bag during those minutes I was in the office, and apologized again, presumably for having my keys in the first place. 
Then he offhandedly gave me an address and said that he didn't live far and if I was interested. I'd like to say that I was this close to grabbing him by the collar and beating the crap out of him. But something in my gut urged me strongly to play along and pretend like this situation wasn't completely insane. The street was deserted. I had no idea if he was armed and how unhinged he was. There were too many variables. No worries, man. I said like he was an old childhood friend who'd just flown into town to surprise me on my birthday. Just wasn't expecting to see you. I had no idea what I should say. It might have been a stupid decision on my part, and there were probably a thousand and one things I should have done instead. But I tried to genuinely meet him halfway and just be as gracious as possible, as calm as possible. That sounds cool, but it's a long night for me and I'm really tired. Can we rain check? A few silent moments passed, but I supposed I sounded genuine enough because he crossed his arms and simply said, Okay. I asked him if he had his car parked nearby and he said no. I didn't press the issue further, and I told him outright that I'd be happy to drop him off at his place, at which point we could trade numbers and make plans in the morning after I'd gotten some sleep. Somehow, appeasement seemed safer than flat out confrontation or running away. I didn't want to offend him or make him feel like he was in the wrong. I had no idea what he was capable of, whether he was actually malevolent or just an alien from another social dimension. He quietly agreed to the ride and it was the longest 10 minutes of my life. On the way, I asked him about how his day went, which games he liked and other random stuff. I mentioned multiple times that I was really glad to meet another gamer and that it'd be fun to share the hobby with someone else just basically whatever it took to keep the conversation light and flowing. But he didn't say much aside from occasionally directing me to turn left or right, and whatever he did say had a sort of petulant tone to it. I felt like I was driving home a psychotic toddler who had just refused McDonald's. He looked out the passenger window the entire ride. Occasionally I would glance over to him, but mostly I tried to keep my eyes forward because I found that focusing on the road made me feel more centered. Of course, a part of me now wishes I had acted more assertively, whipping around a sharp turnaround and sending him flying effortlessly out the window. You know, something badass. But being friendly and accommodating was really the only thing that seemed to be appropriate at the time. My grandfather says, kill him with kindness. And I disagree. That's always the correct solution. But it's what I did that night, and it worked. I considered driving directly to a police station, but I wasn't terribly familiar with the neighborhood, and I didn't want to rile him up by taking out my phone. Before long, we arrived. The destination was a small park in a suburb that I'd only driven through a few times. He said he'd walk the rest of the way, and at his request, I brought the car to a stop on the corner. There was a short, somewhat terrifying lull before either of us said anything or made any sort of move. I offered to put my number in his phone, but he refused and simply said thanks and got out the car. As soon as he closed the door, I hightailed it down the street and drove aimlessly for about a mile before I pulled over and just idled on the side of a main road. I sat in silence for a few moments and then called my boss, who at this point is a good friend. Honestly, I didn't care it was after 2 a.m. He answered after a few rings and I quickly regurgitated everything that had happened. He was a good sport about it and didn't just play it off for laughs, instead expressing legitimate concern. We had a mandatory staff meeting in the morning, which everyone was told they needed to be on guard and how the bar would be installing several cameras for extra security. Thankfully, I haven't seen Vern again since that night, nor have any of the other bartenders. So Vern, let's not meet at my bar or anywhere else. I have bear spray now. A number of years ago, I was walking through the cemetery one late evening with my dog. It was my custom to do this, and I was having a smoke while talking to my girlfriend on the phone, letting my dog run around. The cemetery itself is closed off with fences to not disrespect the graves and my dog was running around the park area, free to do whatever he needed, and I was just following him around while focusing on my phone call. 
Just as I was talking to her, she was telling me something about some shoes she got on a discount. When I look over to my dog and I can't see him, I start twisting my head frantically, and out of the corner of my eye I see something move. I twist, expecting to see my dog, but I see a transparent figure glide past me. The strangest thing about it is they were walking along a path, or well, should I say, gliding, but their feet and half their legs were not on the floor. It's hard to describe. It's almost as if there was a subfloor underneath where I was standing, and they were walking along that. Their legs moving briskly, and then vanishing about three seconds later. I stopped talking. My girlfriend didn't pay attention as she was doing all the chatting, and after about half a minute, did I realize and internalize what I had just witnessed. At that point, my dog comes running from behind me and jumps up, which pulls my attention back to the conversation at hand and my dog. I don't even tell my girlfriend what happened, and after a while, say I have to go and walk back home with my dog, trying to contemplate what I had just seen. It left me very confused. I've never believed in the paranormal, and I have no way. To shake off or deny what I undoubtedly saw. This happened a few years ago when I was still living with my mum, and I had borrowed her car to go see my then boyfriend for the evening. It was around midnight when I got back to my neighbourhood, so the roads were empty, and that's when I noticed this dirty, run-down, rusted white utility van. That a maintenance guy would drive, following me. I never even saw the driver's face, but I got this immediate sinking feeling in my stomach because something felt wrong about this van. Now I was only twenty at the time, but I knew better than to just drive straight to my house and letting this person know exactly where I lived, no matter how desperately I wanted to just go home and ignore it. But I also wasn't a hundred percent sure they actually were following me yet. I didn't want to jump to conclusions. Just because it was late and I was alone and paranoid, so I drove to a shopping complex a few minutes out the way that's well lit and has a public library to see if I was followed there. I thought I lost the van, but decided to wait in the parking lot a few minutes because I had a bad feeling I couldn't shake. Sure enough, the van showed up and was driving in random circles around the parking lot, looking for me. This scared me quite a bit. So I drove towards the big mall that's always got security police presence. Because it was the midway point between where I was and where I lived, I parked in a pretty well lit, although empty, 24-hour McDonald's parking lot, where I had a great view of the roads and the mall. But I wasn't super easy to spot, and waited to see if the van showed up looking for me. It did, and of course, this would be the only time. The security and the cops are nowhere to be found, which is half the reason I decided to head there in the first place. Realizing whoever was driving this van was a hundred percent actively following me in the middle of the night, I knew just driving home was not an option, and that's a terrifying realization. Luckily, the police station is just a few minutes away from where I was, so I try and discreetly drive away, hoping the van hadn't noticed me yet. I wasn't that lucky, because it wasn't before long that it was in my rearview mirror once more. At this point, I'm panicking pretty hard, and my anxiety is high. I finally pulled into the police station parking lot, and seconds later, the van came to a stop in the middle of the road for no more than a few seconds. I'm guessing just long enough for them to realize where I'd led them, and took off really fast immediately. I did make it home safe and without seeing the van again. Not long after. But this whole ordeal took less than an hour of my night up. It was after 1 a.m. by the time I made it home, and I was terrified the entire time. I don't know what this guy's specific intention was, but honestly, I don't need to know. I know it was nothing good, and I likely avoided a very bad situation. If you think someone is following you, it's not stupid or paranoid to make sure you aren't right. Who knows what might have happened if I'd have led him to my house, or gotten. Out of the car.
I worked as an emergency room porter slash attendant before med school. And one night, one of the security guards came bolting down the hallway telling everyone not to use the taps. Of course, a nurse was right in the middle of washing her hands, so she freaks out, flings her hand in the air thinking the taps are poisoned or something. I'm not sure what her reasoning was, but I digress. The security guard asks her if the water was really hot, but she said it was lukewarm at best. What had happened is he was taking a dump on the third floor and was splashed in the ass with boiling hot water. His first assumption was a boiler malfunction, closely followed by a fire in the walls boiling the water in the pipes. The security team brought in the fire department just in case, and they did all kinds of system checks with the water shut off. No other hot water except for his one magical ghost infested throne on the third floor. The older staff always claimed that the ambulatory care unit was haunted by a ghost named Winnie, an old nurse that died while at work, and the toilet the guard was on at the time happened to be directly above the unit, albeit two floors up. I'll never forget how freaked out he looked, thinking he was splashed on the butt by a horny old nurse lady ghost. I was 16 at the time, working as a shift manager at a frozen yogurt place. I typically would close up shop alone. Don't ask why, the owner thought it would be a good idea for a 16 year old girl to close a yogurt store alone at 10pm and handled all of the closing work, counting registers, separating tips and cleaning up. 20 minutes before closing time, alone in this shop, a man walked in and immediately gave me a creepy vibe. He was dressed in dark clothing, didn't make any eye contact, and didn't say a word to me. He paced around the shop for what seemed like hours, when realistically, it was only a minute or so. We had an emergency button on our register that we were instructed to push in the event of a robbery or emergency situation. To me, as a 16 year old girl alone in a frozen yogurt shop with a man pacing around inside in silence, in dark clothing around closing time, this constituted an emergency situation, so I pressed the button. Immediately after pressing it, I asked the man if he needed something, to which point he said, No. I was preparing at any point for him to pull out some sort of weapon, but thankfully he began to leave as law enforcement was pulling up. Just as he walked outside, law enforcement were exiting their vehicles and he took off running. They nabbed him, questioned him, and placed him into custody. Long story short, as I was just told by the deputies, he had just finished robbing the subway next door about 30 minutes before he came into my shop. They were uncertain whether or not it was his intention to rob me as well, but thankfully because of the swift action of the law enforcement, and them already being in the area because of the previous robbery next door, that didn't happen. So to the creepy guy pacing in my yogurt shop at closing time, I hope to never meet again. There's a cemetery by one of the churches nearby that boasts to be the oldest in town, Bear Creek Cemetery. It is the oldest and smallest. It's set pretty deep and you can barely see it from the highway it passes by. As a kid, we went on field trips there. This was in the 1980s, so seriously kind of screwed up to take some seven to 11 year olds. There was something really creepy and from the stories, apparently there's a ghost that appears and leads you back to the entrance if you get lost. Thankfully, my teacher was not directionally challenged, but she did tell us never to go at night. According to what I was told, some teenagers from Evergreen High School were being stupid and got locked in. The cemetery closes at 7pm. The cemetery closes at 7pm, at least when I was a kid. It may be earlier now, and the gate is impossible to climb. Now, from what I was told, and honestly, the teens were saying that they saw green lights all over the place. There are no electric lights there. It's so weird. But of course, I was skeptical of the story when it was told to me, and I was nine. Did I want to try my luck? No. But one of the teachers decided we would wait by the entrance for the rest of the field trip group. 
We were kind of playing near a creek bed right by the entrance. It was 2pm and we were waiting for the rest of class. We had to do gravestone rubbings for part of our project. We did ours early and just waited for the rest. My teacher, myself and maybe three others were just milling around unaware of the time. In fact, somehow we almost missed the bus back to Walmart. It felt like time froze in that place, and I was wearing an analog watch, and unbeknownst to nine-year-old me, the battery died. Which was weird, seeing as I'd only just got it. What's also strange were all the pictures my teacher took of us kids were all washed out. She made a school scrapbook and snapped pictures of us doing the gravestone rubbings. What sucked is she threw the pictures away, so I have just memories, and my parents didn't trust me with a camera till I was 11. I still want to go back and do the gravestone rubbings of the old graves before they fade away from the elements. About four years ago, I was a line cook at a restaurant that was located in a hotel. I worked at this restaurant for nearly two years with no problem. Walking the half mile or so distance it took me to reach the bus, I took to get home from my job. This restaurant had a partnership with the hotel for late night room service. So pretty much every night after closing the restaurant, one, sometimes two line cooks would stay until 3am preparing simple things like salads, sandwiches and wraps that would be taken to rooms via hotel employees. Now, me being a recent college graduate in my early 20s would always volunteer for the extra hours. Student loans and rent cost a lot. As I said prior, I had worked this job for a decent amount of time with no problems. Except for one rainy night I'll never forget. As I left work at 3 in the morning, I realized I messed up when I forgot an umbrella that day. I now had to make my normal walk under decent rainfall. And after lighting a cigarette and putting in my headphones, I was ready to make my unfortunate journey. I started on my normal routine walking back, cutting through the alleyways I had memorized as my shortcuts through the city. About halfway through my walk, a car started following me with the passenger window down. Aware of my surroundings, I had recognized this, but decided to mind my own business and keep my head down and carry on walking. Growing up in a rough neighborhood taught me better than to put my nose where it doesn't belong. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough. Over the music coming from my headphones, I could hear shouting from the car. I turned to face the car driver but didn't stop walking. He looked at me, a white man in his late 30s or early 40s, with a bandana and sunglasses on. I remember thinking it was odd, he was driving with sunglasses so late at night. Hey man, where are you heading? I could hear him say. At this point, I took out one earbud and replied, What's it to you? To which he answered, figured I'd ask. You look like you need a ride to get out the rain. I told the guy I'm all set and that I was almost at my destination. Now keep in mind, I'm still walking and he's driving slowly next to me on this side of the street at 3 a.m. No problem. Do you want to smoke some weed? At this point, I was annoyed with the guy. I had just gotten done working 13 hours in a kitchen, and all I wanted to do was to listen to some music before bed and unwind. Nah, man, I don't, even though I did. I replied in a stern and obviously annoyed tone. He just looked at me, almost like he knew I was lying. Have a good night, I said, before replacing my earphone back into my ear and taking the right up a one-way street losing him in the process. I arrived to my bus stop safely and with about 10 minutes to spare. I was the only one there beside one homeless man sleeping on a bench some ways up. And after three minutes, the car pulls up to the side of the curb, directly in the bus lane. This time I'm facing him. He rolls down the window. You're heading the south side, huh? How do you know? He points above me. I look up on the digital board and it says the next bus destination and time. You want a lift? I'm heading that way. At this point, I was all set and the hood came out of me. Hey man, I don't know who you are. I don't want to ride, so just piss off. 
I said angrily. He stared at me again, but this time I stared back. We locked eyes for a good 20 seconds before the bus approached behind, honking loudly. The guy checked his rearview mirror, rolled up the window and sped off. On the way home, I remember looking back behind me and my surroundings to make sure this creep didn't try and follow me home. Luckily, he didn't. And when I got off the bus, I was in my apartment safe within five minutes. Fast forward a week. One of my buddies who I worked with asked me if I heard about the body that the cops found in a dumpster behind a grocery store less than five minutes from the hotel. I replied, no. He told me it was the body of a girl that was found strangled to death and the cops are on the lookout for a killer still at large. The cops have no evidence and were asking for people to come forward with additional information. I hadn't told my buddy or anyone beside my girlfriend at the time what happened that night. When I told him my story, he insisted I call the cops and tell them what happened. I told him I would, but never did. Called me old school, but like I said earlier, I learned growing up to mind my own business and avoid trouble, and trouble won't find me. So that's what I did. To this day, I haven't heard anything more about the case. I wonder if it was the same guy. I think about how weird it was for him to approach me the way he did, at such an odd hour of the day. The sunglasses, following me to the bus stop. That stuff doesn't normally happen, right? After that experience, I started walking home with my paring knife in my pocket and walked with only one earphone in the whole time so that I could better hear my surroundings. I also stopped volunteering for the overnight shift. Whoever killed that girl, I hope they get caught or has a change of heart. It's crazy how fragile life is. My mother trained as a nurse at the Old Westminster Teaching Hospital in London in the 1950s. On one of her first night shifts, she was doing rounds in a children's ward. Everything was fine, all the kids were asleep, but in one of the rooms, she found the sink faucet running, which was a bit weird because it had been fine when she'd been there a few minutes before. She figured that one of the kids had gotten up and been thirsty or something, turned it off and carried on with the rounds. When her shift was over, she went to check out with the matron who asked if she had anything to report. She said nothing except that someone had left the faucet on in one of the rooms. The matron looked horrified and gasped out, oh no. She then explained that the ward was haunted by a ghost which washed its hands, leaving the faucet running whenever a child was going to pass. My mother laughed this off, pointed out that none of the kids in the ward were seriously ill and went home. When she came in for her night shift the next evening, she discovered that a previously perfectly fine child in that room had suffered a sudden seizure and passed a few hours after she'd found the open faucet. I'm almost 30 and I'm female and have been told I look 16 to 18 depending on the outfit. I have an anxiety disorder and additionally I have issues picking up social cues. So sometimes I misunderstand things or get paranoid about things that are really innocent. So I've learned to question my thoughts. I've been working in the food service industry for a few years and in particular about two years at the place I'm in now. This incident happened a year ago. I had just started working some late night shifts and we hired a new manager, Peter. He was a foot or so taller than me, skinny with dark eyes and large glasses. He wasn't physically imposing, but still made me nervous because he was new. There are reasons new males put me on edge, but that is a story for another day. After a few days, I noticed some odd things about him. Whenever I worked the counter, he would stand so close behind me that I could feel the cloth of his shirt brush my back because he was looking over my shoulder. I worked here before he did and had for at least a year, so it bugged me. If I was stuck in the drive through area instead, he would stand in a way that I was blocked in and couldn't get past him. 
and every time I bent over, it looked like he was staring at my butt. At first, I figured I was just imagining it, that he wasn't purposefully blocking me in. Surely I was just being paranoid. After a few more weeks of working there, he started buying pizza for the crew or drinks from nearby businesses, and he was always the one to go pick it up and bring it in. I wouldn't eat anything unless the rest of the crew did and never drank anything I didn't get for myself, nor did I leave anything in the back office just in case. I kept telling myself I was overreacting, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Well, one night I was told I had to do a late night shift, just me, Peter and Jack, someone who had worked there a long time, and I trust him implicitly. Before the others left, I asked Jack to please keep an eye on Peter because he scared me. That night, Peter asked me to clean the bathrooms, and I had no choice but to agree. To illustrate the layout of the building, in order to get to the bathrooms from the main office, you go to the kitchen, around the corner, through a doorway into the entryway, and from there you open the men's room door, and from there, there is a back wall stall with the door that I was in. So I'm there in the main men's stall and Jack is in the kitchen, as far as I know, with Peter in the office. As my back is turned, I hear the propped open men's room door shut. I turn around blocking my exit to the men's stall, and there's Peter. Immediately, I panic because that means three closed doors between me and Jack. Peter holds up a pair of drive through headgear and makes a comment like, So I found these new ones in the office. You want to use them? I probably shouldn't give them to you, but I like you, so I figured why not. I declined and honestly, I was shaking out my shoes. Innocent as the dialogue was, he was looking at me up and down the whole time, and it just felt creepy. He stood there about a foot away and just stared at me, not saying anything. And after a minute or so, Jack came in and said there was a phone call, and Peter had to come and get it. Naturally, I booked in out that bathroom and stuck myself to Jack, explaining that I was really scared and felt uncomfortable with the way Peter looked at me, and the odd way he was behaving. Well, to me it was odd anyway, but again, I felt like I was probably paranoid. He told me he wouldn't let me out of his sight for the rest of the night, and he kept good on his word. A few hours later, Peter says he's grabbing a pizza and some soda from the place I mentioned earlier. When he came back, he called me to the back office and offered me a glass of soda, pre-poured, and I respectfully declined, thinking to myself that I was being stupidly over-paranoid. But then again, why did he always bring soda when we had a hundred kinds on premises? He asked me another two to three times if I was sure, and I again declined. Jack right beside me. Then Peter asked me if I had a boyfriend. I did, but lied and said fiancé, because I figured it would maybe dissuade any potential flirting. Fiancé? Aren't you a little young for that? I don't know why I told him my age. He just kind of sat there and looked me up and down really slowly and he said, Oh, I thought you were 16 or 17. From there, he left me pretty much alone. About three days later, he was arrested because the place he worked before, he had apparently inappropriately touched an underaged female co-worker and threatened them and told them he was a cop and so on and would arrest them if he ever told anyone. He was eventually transferred from where we worked and we were never told anything until his arrest. He's come by twice since then, even though he's not allowed on property because we have minors on site. I'm still freaked out especially because the last time he came around, it was the drive through where I was standing. So Peter, let's not meet again. I travel to many different cemeteries for work in Massachusetts. I am a grave salesperson and go to these cemeteries on an at need basis. One day I was finishing up a sale and decided to use the bathroom in the tiny office shed in the back. The door to enter the office was locked, but the bathroom door was broken and wouldn't close all the way. I didn't care that the bathroom door wouldn't really close because no one was coming into the office anyway. It was late and all the groundsmen went home for the day. Just as I finished my business, the bathroom door slammed shut and since the knob was broken, the door just bounced and swung open. My first reaction was that someone entered the office and the air pressure sucked the door open. I run out and see no one came in, 
There were no open windows to cause a breeze, and this door just slammed shut on its own. I was shaken up, but I still had some paperwork to complete. I acknowledged there may be a presence in the room, with me, but I didn't want to appear frightened if there was. So I sat down there for a few minutes and took my time finishing the work. Nothing has happened there since, but I always acknowledge the entity as if it's watching over the place. I was 19 years old. I was in Paris, as I had been many times before. However, this time I was not alone, but with one female friend of mine. She'd been masking me often to join me on my weekend trips because she wanted to share my exciting lifestyle. She listened to my stories of models and movie stars hanging out at my favorite Parisian club and wanted to join in on the fun. So we decided to take this trip together. We booked a train ticket and a room in a cozy hotel near Chatelet, and we went. On our first day, we walked for hours, checking out just a few of the many colorful areas where I used to always hang out. Late in the afternoon, we decided to go back to the hotel, have something to eat, and then prepare ourselves to go clubbing. While doing so though, my friend started to feel sick. Maybe she ate something that her stomach disagreed with. But let's just say that the bathroom became her best friend. And so I suggested we stay in the hotel, watch a movie or something and head back out the day after. My friend though, feeling guilty for holding me back, insisted I would go to the club on my own. I was used to walking around my favorite city alone, but I did not feel comfortable leaving her by herself. She kept assuring me she'd be fine. So I got myself ready for a night out and went. As I got to the club, there was a huge crowd standing in line, waiting to be chosen by this female bouncer. It looked like she was checking people out from a distance to decide whether they were worthy of getting in. When I got there, a limousine pulled up and the crowd was ordered to move for the special guest. No waiting in line for him. I was all the way in the back of the line, but since I'm very tall and back then had a model look, the bouncer looked me up, pointed at me and asked if I was alone. As soon as I told her, she gestured for me to come in. And so I walked through the crowd of about 100 people to the front door of the club feeling quite special for having been selected. I had an amazing time. I danced all night with people I'd never met before, yet we were like one big dance crew. It felt great. Good music, good dancers, and I had the time of my life, which for me only takes those two ingredients. About four in the morning, I felt it was time to go back to the hotel. I had an active day ahead of me, so I needed at least a few hours of sleep, and I left. I felt very at home in this big city, and I decided to walk back to the hotel. And although every now and then a car would pull up next to me, thinking I was walking around so late looking for work, a simple no always made it clear that my purpose was actually from get to A to B and not make money while doing so. I felt totally safe as I continued my little stroll in the early morning, gradually approaching the hotel. I wanted to cross the road to make sure I could do that safely even though there was no traffic as the city was asleep at this time. I looked left and right and then saw him, a young man on a sports bike on the sidewalk about 30 meters behind me. As soon as he saw that I had noticed him, he sped up and started riding his bike next to me. I crossed the road and he followed asking for a cigarette. I told him I don't smoke, but considering the fact that I was female and all by myself, I decided not to be kind to him. In this situation, it might easily be misunderstood. I answered, but that was it. I clearly showed him I wasn't in the mood to talk and he seemed numb to the rejection and carried on behind me without saying a word. Meanwhile, we had gotten to this small park, Chatalet, which separated me from the hotel but I felt uneasy and started to panic because of this guy. It was in the early morning, but every few minutes you could hear a car in the distance and no one else to be seen in the streets. 
God help me, I'm in trouble, I thought. And this is what makes the story unbelievable. Out of nowhere came a car from the left, stopped, honked his horn and waved at me. I walked towards him and asked him for help. When I looked back at the guy on the bike, I noticed that the two other guys had joined him. They must have been walking behind me. As soon as I spoke to the driver, the biker started yelling at me and threatening me. It was scary, and all the things he said he would do to me, it still makes chills run down my spine. The guy in the car, a total stranger, told me that he was willing to help me take me back to my hotel. However risky that was. Refusing his offer meant that I would be alone again, and then definitely in danger. So I jumped in. When he started driving, I was still in shock, but every time he turned into a street that would just seem to go in the other direction, I panicked. He assured me that if I felt unsafe, I could just get out, and that there are many one-way streets in Paris, and there was simply no other way to get to where I wanted to go. I trusted him, and he did as he said and drove me to the front door of my hotel and left. I went to my room and had a very scary story to tell to my friend who was quite happy after all that, that she had been unable to join me. I work for a level one trauma center receiving for 11 counties, implying a fair amount of carnage routinely. One morning between 3 and 4am I was alone in the bay. We have four trauma bays and two recess rooms in a rectangle surrounding the nurses station. Catching up on documentation, I became aware of a man walking up from behind me on the right, outside the nurse's station and into one of the trauma rooms, except I didn't hear any doors open. Big, noisy, motion-activated doors. He looked at me over his shoulder, and as he walked through the room doors, but didn't answer when I called out hello. I walked around, losing sight of the bay door, as I rounded a big column to make sure it wasn't a lost visitor and there was no one there. There's no way out other than through that door, and it was out of my line of sight for maybe a second max. I later related this story in heebie-jeebies I felt while I was looking for the strange dude to another nurse. She said she had the exact same experience last week. People bring it up from time to time, same story, guy walks into the room and is then gone by the time you go look for him. We've decided to just leave him alone, I hope he finds what he's looking for, though. I work at a golf course. I work behind the food counter. There's only one girl that works behind the food counter at a time. There is me and six other girls that work there. That's it. The rest were all men. Most of the older men have made attempts to hit on me. And they're jokes, but they never say anything bad. Nothing outside of, you're so pretty, or anything like that. One guy, however, has stuck out. I started working there this past May, and this one older guy, probably mid-60s, knows my aunt, so we kind of got along. A few months passed without an incident. He friended me on Facebook, and I didn't think twice about it. Then he made some weird comments to me. Okay, first off, he started talking about his daughter's ass. Then he said, you have a small one compared to hers, twice. And I was like, okay. And since then, I haven't turned my back to him. I posted a picture on Facebook with one of my friends. We were at the water park and in bikinis. That guy came into work next day asking about her. Who's the other girl in the bikini with you? And he asked her name and how I met her. I refused to give out any real information. Then, not long after, he started asking questions about relationships I'd been in, like how long they lasted and how old I was. One night, he even followed me to my car. It was pretty dark out, a little after 9pm, and I parked pretty far away. I carry a taser, so I had it in my hands as I was walking. There's a bar across the street, and we allow people to park in our parking lot when there's no parking left in the bar. I was around 5 to 10 feet away from my car when I heard someone say, Hey, right behind me. I whirl around, taser in hand, and he started asking all these questions about my car. My car did have some issues a few months back, but they've all been fixed. 
I also told him that. He walked over to my driver's side and started looking where I used to have a dent. I got it in an accident and had a dent in the winter and basically said my car is fine, I'm leaving and jumped in my car and sped off. I got so fed up, I told some of the other workers and my supervisor. I found out customers have been complaining about him and he sometimes harasses the women that visit here. Most of the other workers don't like him, especially the girls at the counter. He takes golf balls too. The season just somewhat ended and I've heard a rumor that he won't be returning. Let's just hope for everyone's sake, this rumor turns out to be true. About 10 years ago, I was in college and my history teacher wanted us to go to a historical site of our choosing, take pictures and write about it. I chose a small cemetery in my hometown that I would pass by that was wedged between two apartment complexes that always fascinated me. It was fenced off so I couldn't go in, but I was able to take a picture with my digital camera of the historic marker. And while I was at it, I took a few more photos for fun. Once I got home, I put the SD card in my computer and thumbed through the photos. At first glance, I didn't notice anything. But on one of the photos, I noticed a blue orb in the trees and two red and orange orbs at the base of the trees. I zoomed in on the blue orb, but nothing really spectacular when I zoomed into the red ones. And that's when things got interesting. I saw faces like tiny little men with big round noses and a chubby older face with crow's feet smiling. I think one was wearing a hat and one was not. I don't remember beards and one of them without a hat was bald. I also saw what looked like a squirrel trapped in the bark of a tree. Like one of them put it there. I was so excited to see it. I called my boyfriend at the time to the computer to look. He saw what I saw. And at that moment, my card got corrupted. I was so upset. I think we weren't supposed to have seen them and somehow they managed to mess up the card. As for my history assignment, I went to another historical site and got my pick. I'm a 16 year old girl living in rural Virginia. The neighborhood I live in is in the woods and very safe. A few months back, I was walking home from the bus stop. It's about a half mile walk from the bus stop to my house, but I don't mind walking at all. I live in the forest and the trees were beautiful that day with beautiful weather. Field hockey practice was canceled also. So it made walking home that much sweeter. Well, with us living out in the forest a ways away from anything urban or suburban for that matter, our little community is constantly expanding and in turn, seeing new houses being built. I lived on a dead end road with my house at the bottom of a hill. So our house is pretty shielded by the slope and surrounding trees. Just a few days before this creepy encounter, a construction company had began to clear a lot on the other side of the road further down. At this time, they had orange tape bordering the lot. So no extensive clearing had been started yet. But as I walked home and started to walk down the road leading up to my house, I saw a tan truck pull up on the side of the road. Even months later, I can vividly recall that it had extremely tinted windows. You couldn't even see into the vehicle, let alone the driver. At first, I didn't think much of it. But once I got within 20 ish feet of it, the truck turned on its headlights and began to back up as I got closer. I am naturally a jumpy paranoid person. So I immediately walked off the road and was onto a lawn, trying to put distance between the truck and myself. At first, I thought it was merely a coincidence that the truck just happened to back up as I got closer. But the moment I began to walk past it, the driver started to back up at an angle, positioning the rear end of the truck right in my path, putting the truck at an angle that effectively blocked the entire road. Now I began to panic a little. I quickened my pace and walked into my neighbor's yard, walking from that yard to the next. Once I had sidestepped the truck, it had stopped altogether just sitting there in the middle of the road with its headlights on. At that moment, I knew the truck was indeed following me. 
I couldn't show the driver which house was mine. And still staring at the tanned truck, I walked from yard to yard, passing over driveways, but never going onto the road. I walked past my house once, but made sure that I didn't look at it or give any indication that it was mine. After what seemed like minutes, the truck began to drive away, but very, very slowly. Once it drove up the street nearby, a few hundred feet or so, it stopped again to, I assume, see if I'd go into a house. I didn't. I stood there besides a trash can and stared at it. And after a minute or two, the truck finally drove off. I realized looking back that it could have just been someone looking at the lot undergoing construction, but it doesn't shake the uneasy feeling. I can't forget how utterly tinted those windows were and how it literally followed me. I regret not getting the license plate, especially since I had a huge opportunity to, but at the moment, the thought didn't cross my mind. All I cared about was getting away from the truck and protecting my house. I also learned that safety is indeed in numbers. At the time of this encounter, I was taking the less traveled route because there were less kids. The scenery was beautiful, it was quiet, and less cars traveled that route. Now when I walk home, I walk with the rest of the kids and always keep an eye out for that truck. To the person in the tan truck, let's never meet. In college, I worked at an orderly and acute treatment psychiatric hospital. I was there for about a year and a half, during which time I worked the night shift on the stabilization unit. This was the unit for people who were too unstable to be grouped in with the regular men or women's units. Often they would become psychotic and we'd find some meds that worked for them. And within a week, they would be transferred to a unit with more freedom. My first night on the job, I walked in feeling nervous. At the desk, two other techs were chatting with a woman in a hospital gown. I came over and she introduced herself. She seemed completely normal. She told me not to worry about my first shift and that I would do just fine. And that she was sure all the other staff would help me out until I found my footing. I felt deeply reassured. This woman didn't seem like she belonged in the ward. She seemed completely normal. Then she said she had to go back to bed and turned around. The back of her head was gone. Where the back of her head was, all the hair had been shaved off and there was a gory mass of scars and stitches and bruising. It looked like something out of a horror film. I seriously can't describe how messed up it was. It looked like she'd been shot and then someone had hastily tried to put it back together. I'm proud to say I didn't react but immediately after she'd gone back to her room, I asked the other techs what the deal was. They said that she tried to take her own life by driving a car into a tree and had several brain surgeries and was still recovering. They said most of the time she was perfectly lucid, but had instances of sudden and extreme violence, which is why she was on that unit. She also had a habit of picking at the wound, which was still healing. She had a couple more reconstructions to go because of the extent to which her skull had been mangled. Honestly, after I read her file, I was surprised she was still alive. Anyway, it scared the ever loving crap out of me. It was such a perfectly horror movie trope. That was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me on a night shift. I remember wondering if the other techs had set it up to freak me out on my first night. The lady became one of my favorite patients. And aside from the occasional outburst was one of the most well behaved and best spoken. We had a lot of late night conversations until she was transferred. I'm a 21 year old female about five foot six with glasses and blonde hair. I work at a hotel doing housekeeping and used to work the food area serving breakfast and dinner but I switched to the back of the house about three months after starting. This story starts when I was still working up front doing food service. I come in for my normal shift as the dinner attendant and started to make the food. While I'm working, my assistant general manager walks in called Pam holding a piece of paper. You have a secret admirer, someone named Bill the taco boy left it. He gave you his number. I look at her confused and ask, why? 
It was given to the manager on duty last night, and they asked them to give it to the tall girl with the blonde hair and glasses, apparently. So I take the paper, threw it away because I had no idea who Bill the Taco Bell boy was, and continued on with my shift as normal, and go home. The next day I come in to be the breakfast attendant, and the MOD that had gotten Bill's number was there, so I asked him about it. Oh yeah, he didn't even get your name. The only reason I knew he was talking about you is because he described you. Then I asked her what he looked like, trying to figure out if I had spoken to him before. He was probably around 50, had glasses, was short, stocky, and smelled of alcohol. My first thought is, great, another creep. I tell her I'd never seen this man in my life. And she goes on to tell me he had checked out and I should be okay. Fast forward about a month and I've switched to housekeeping. The entryway to our rooms has a tile since it's connected to the bathroom area. And when we wipe them down, we usually do it on our hands and knees. One day I was wiping down my bathroom slash entry floorway, minding my own business, listening to my 600 pound life, when I feel eyes searing into me. I had my back to the door, so I turn around to see if someone was there. There's this man, about 50, stocky with glasses. At this point, I had totally forgotten about the bill situation and didn't think anything of it. Hi, was there something I could help you with? I ask in my customer service voice and a huge smile, standing up so I could actually talk to him instead of being crouched on the floor. You never text or called me, he replied. What? I asked, genuinely confused. He looked at me in the most serious face and asked, You don't remember? I'm Bill. I left you my number hoping you could get hold of me. Everything comes back to me now, and I'm kind of shocked and don't know what to say. I'm sorry, we aren't allowed to talk to our guests outside of work. It's company policy. Then why didn't your manager say I couldn't give you my number? I had absolutely no idea what to say back to this. So I made up some answer to try to get him away from me. She's new and must not have realized I'm sorry. Is there anything I could do for you though? I ask, now realizing he's literally standing in the doorway of the room. No, just know I'll never forget about you and that little ass as you wipe down the floor. And with that, he walked away. Luckily, I haven't seen this man again, but now I have a Swiffer that I put my rag on to clean our tile. I have no idea what would have happened if I'd have actually texted this man, but thank God I threw his number away. And also that he didn't try anything when he absolutely could have. My dad and uncle, both in their 60s now, are not the kind of people to believe in the supernatural, not ever. But once we had this discussion going about the scariest experiences, mostly jokes and whatnot, so they both recall this one time when they were about 15 and 18 each, my dad being the younger one. Back home in Morocco in the older days, there was this stupid game where teenagers in the countryside would like to prove that they were fearless and not children anymore. The game was to go into an abandoned and old Muslim graveyard and go into the centerpiece, which was usually a small mausoleum where someone of great religious importance was buried or just a small mosque and then light a candle. So my uncle is the one who go into the graveyard and do the deed, get into the small building and light the candle and then leave back to rejoin the group. So my uncle easily gets through the graveyard into the building and lights the candle. Then as soon as he leaves, the candle goes off. His group tells him to go back and light it and the process starts back and again the candle goes off. Now they are slowly getting creeped out. So they all get inside the building. They light the candle and start looking around. What they see next scares the light out of them. A person in full Moroccan jaliaba, a traditional Moroccan's memoir outfit, is sitting on a bench and looking at the ground. They can't see the face since it has a hood on. Now they haul ass and don't stop until they're far away. My father and uncle never told anyone that story and they still flatly refused to believe that it was anything paranormal. But from their tone, you can tell that for two very rational and logical men, they are still unsure by whatever was there, 
especially that the place was next to a village in the middle of nowhere, where everyone knew each other. The old children's ICU is currently under construction to be turned into medical labs, so we have to patrol the area. Once again to make sure the area is secure, or to report it to the contractor slash foreman, stayed to plan the next day. When patrolling the area, several security officers have reported seeing a single white male child with short brown hair in a 90s bowl cut, about five to seven years of age. I personally dismissed this, as this was before the psych ward incident, as a tall tale told with the intent to scare me because I was new at the time. I got that building's patrol one night, and a foreman who stayed late called security and asked for a security officer to come up because a kid locked himself in a room, and I don't want him to get hurt with all the open wires in there, or something to that effect. I unlocked the door for him, looked in what could only be a 10 by 8 room for about 10 minutes. No kid, called it in as a false alarm, and finished my patrol. I was walking home from work late one night. I had volunteered to print out some flyers and put them on everyone's desk, as well as some other menial office tasks, as I really needed the money. It must have been close to 10 at this point, and I was just putting everything in my backpack and preparing to leave the door. For context, I'm a guy in my mid 30s and know the city I live in very well. It was a 10 minute walk to my bus stop and then a short bus ride back to my apartment. It's a route I always take, not always this late, but it's very familiar to me. As I'm making my way to the bus stop, I look behind me because I heard something, someone running. I turn around and there's a guy running really fast. He zooms past me and carries on running round a corner. I think nothing of it and just carry on plodding along to my destination. I keep walking, and I look to the left, the road he went down out of interest, and notice that he can no longer be seen. That's funny, I thought, and carry on on my way. A little while later, I get to the bus stop, and looking up at the notice board, I see it won't be there for a few minutes. So I stand there anxiously looking around, seeing if by any chance the bus is early. And that's when I see the man. He's no longer running, but now hiding behind a tree watching me. That's weird, I thought. What the hell is he doing? I try to put it to the back of my mind, and within a few minutes, my bus arrives. I hop on, make my way to the back, and as I sit down, my blood runs cold. The man ran in front of the bus, stopped it, and the bus driver actually opened the doors for him. He hopped in, he didn't look at me, and sat towards the front. Oh crap, is he following me I think? Surely not. Like I said, I don't live very far from the bus stop. So I start to wonder, if he's following me, he'd get off at the same stop, right? But, there are so many stops on this bus, that more likely than not, he won't be getting off. So, I come up with the theory. I'm gonna get off at the stop before, and bait him. And if he goes to the door, I'll say after you, and then as he gets off, I'll just stay on. I thought it was a clever idea. And as it got to the stop before mine, I got up as if I were going to leave. He obviously took notice, stands up, and is standing by the doors waiting for them to open. As they open, I say in my most customer service voice, after you, sir. He looks up at me for the first time and walks off the bus. Just as I'm about to get off, I make out like I forgot something. And at that moment, the bus closes the doors and drives off. The guy is still standing at the bus stop, but the smile he had on his face is completely gone. There's a sour look with malice in his eyes as I drive away, staring at him through the window. I knew for a fact 
he had bad intentions. The bus stop that I got off at was about a mile away, so I doubt he could have made it in time. But still, I power walked home, locked my doors, shut my lights off and looked out the window just to make sure he wasn't around. I didn't sleep easy that night, but I never saw him again, and I hope I never do. Over this summer, I was at Oregon County Fair getting ready to head out of camp with my boyfriend. We were packing up our car tent on top of his FJ cruiser, and I went up to the tent to start throwing out our things to pack up. The metal ladder is very slippery and had no grip tape on it, and I was sadly wearing socks. While coming out of the tent, I slipped and fell seven feet straight onto my head. My boyfriend dropped everything and rushed to me, asking if I was okay, and I replied that I was fine, but my head hurts. I have no recollection of any of this. He told me to sit down in the car, and I was getting upset that he wasn't letting me get up and help him pack things. I guess out of annoyance, I got out of the car, and my legs collapsed beneath me. He called the paramedics immediately, and I started to slip into complete blackness. I don't remember much else, which is where the real story begins. I'm in the ambulance, and I can hear the sirens. I feel the oxygen enter my nose. I hear the EMTs yelling my name, but I can't respond, open my eyes, or move. Every second, I keep slipping deeper and deeper into what I can only explain as the darkness. It sounds silly, but this feeling and sensation is honestly indescribable and unlike anything I felt in my life. The EMT, helping me, starts to push incredibly hard with his fingers into my sternum, which brings me back with each press because of the pain. I open my eyes slightly, and I hear the EMT say, only response to painful stimuli, and then I was out. The next thing I remember is the feeling of my clothes being cut off me when I get to the hospital. I apparently then started to have seizures and convulsions due to the lack of oxygen that was coming to my brain. As I slipped, deeper and deeper, and got further and further away from this world, they had to insert a ventilator into me, because I was beginning to cease breathing on my own. My boyfriend was obviously in shambles, and all the doctors could tell him was they were not sure if I would have permanent brain damage, be fine, or die. All the while, I'm slowly dying on the gurney entering the ICU. I remember being stranded in the blackness, floating, wandering, waiting. I was not sure what I was waiting for, or what I was doing in this place. I had no idea what was happening. I saw nothing, and felt nothing. I was nothing. I didn't know who I was, what had happened, or where the hell I was. I remember it felt like floating through endless space, but the thing is, there was an overwhelming sense of calmness through this and I wasn't scared. After almost 24 hours, I started to slowly come back and break consciousness at certain moments of my coma. Then the most beautiful thing happened, and I won't forget it for the rest of my life. My boyfriend was finally left into the ICU to see me. After all this madness that was happening that I was completely gone for, he asked the nurse if he could hold my hand and her response was, yes, but be careful. She will probably sense you. And we can't have her getting excited while she has a tube in her throat. He approached me and at that moment, I slowly started to open my eyes. I remember while I was wandering in what felt like purgatory, all I could think about was Aaron. I didn't know who Aaron was or what Aaron was. But all I knew was the idea of Aaron gave me a feeling of warmth, a reason to find my way out of the dark place. I felt that, as long as I had this thing, I would be okay. Aaron told me, before I had slightly opened my eyes, I started to reach out for him while my eyes were still closed. He grabbed my hand at the moment, and I came back into my body opened my eyes ever so slightly, and started to try and mouth the words, I love you, quickly realizing that the words couldn't come out, 
and that there was a tube in my mouth. Aaron was crying, and I fell back into the nothingness place. Well, obviously I'm fine now. I exited whatever place that was. I've always thought that when someone is dying or about to die, traces of DMT have been found firing off in the brain. Now, I've done DMT, and have blasted off before, and I've even had telepathic contact with what I thought were interdimensional beings while on it. But there was no sign of that in this place. There were no vibrant or beautiful colors, no contact with these special and beautiful creatures. Some people call them machine elves, and no sense of completion into the next realm. It made me wonder if there really is life after death, and if there really is a place I'm going to after I leave my earthly body. Maybe I didn't see these things, because I wasn't ready to make the cross, or start that journey. Maybe the higher powers of the universe needed me to stay here in this world, to complete what I was meant to do here. Maybe this was just the place to wait, while the decision was being made. I don't know, but all I know is that I haven't given up hope. There is somewhere I go to when I'm no longer here. I hope that it will be beautiful. I vividly remember this. It was a Saturday in 2004. I was a freshman in high school and was walking towards Saturday school for getting in trouble. I'm not sure what I did, but my mother dropped me off at a donut shop around 5.30 or so in the morning. She dropped me off early because she had work at six and school was not open. So I ate a few donuts and made my way towards high school. I walked about a block and a half and got to the street where I used to live. It was a creepy street because smack dab in the middle was a very small fenced off cemetery surrounded by eight foot tall iron bars. This cemetery was no more than 100 by 200 feet in size. And I was walking on the side of the street that the cemetery was on. And when I got about halfway past the cemetery, I looked over and saw what looked like a little girl who couldn't have been more than eight or so, who I think was on her knees facing away from me, looking towards one of the gravestones. I stopped and stared at the little girl for a second, not scared, but nervous for her safety. Hey, are you okay? She didn't move or respond to my voice. I called out again. Do you need help? The second time I called out, I reached and sort of hit the iron fence to get her attention. When I hit the fence, the girl turned her body and looked in my direction. The second her eyes met mine, I felt an immediate feeling of dread and unbelievable fear. Her eyes were glowing like a cat's with a light shining on them, but not bright. She then stood up and took a step towards me. That's when someone in my head said run. I turned tail and ran as fast as I could past the cemetery. I ran and then it felt like something was fast behind me, but I didn't look back. As I was about a hundred yards past it, I heard a quick shuffling of feet behind me and a sort of whispering that I couldn't understand in my ear. I didn't stop, and when I turned past the block, it all ended. I caught my breath, and for a few minutes, I just sat there and thought about what just happened. I then made my way to Saturday school, and I really didn't tell anyone for a few years. For a while, I would tear up when I think about what happened, but I'm almost kind of okay with it. I'm a psychiatrist and 55 years old, who's now seeing patients for six hours a week only, almost retired. Back in 1985, as I began my residency, a mute adult male was admitted. He was in his early 20s and would never utter a word and was almost robotic in movements, but he had his smile permanently on his face. For any sight of a smiling in a very odd way man, never uttering a sound, blinking sparsely, and walking in a mechanical fashion. It was hard to deal with as you attempted to communicate with him. His smile deepened as we attempted to speak, and his eyes shined very brightly. Too much lacrimal fluid? I don't know the reason. We did everything that was possible back then, at the very large hospital that it was. 
He did not respond to any treatment including shocks, ECT that is. One day his family came and requested his discharge. After legal and administrative formalities, they took him away. One of the psychiatrists was a married female with kids, who would refuse to see him and told the chief of the unit as well. The guy made her feel scared. She was way senior than me, and always friendly, and I could never ask her why. Many years later, I ran into her at a psychiatric conference. We were both working at different places, and she asked me, do you recall the mute guy who I refused to see and even told the chief of psychiatry unit about? I said yes, the guy with a smile affixed like a stamp to his face. She had a very scary experience with him a few years after his discharge. One morning she was going out to work and a guy stopped her on her driveway. He hands her a small packet and said it was for her. Then she noticed that the package was oozing blood and the guy was dripping blood in torrents. She screamed and drove back. Fortunately, her husband was still in the house. They called the police and their friends. The packet had testicles of the guy who was bleeding like hell. He was in shock. The guy was the smiling man. I'm a female aged 20. I've been working for a well known chain of convenience stores situated mainly on the eastern states of the US. I've been doing this for a little over a year. Since the stores are popular, we get a fair amount of traffic. And in working with the public, you obviously get a few creeps. The first time I had an encounter was actually the day I was interviewed and hired. As I was coming out of the store and celebrating in my head because I had just gotten the first job I'd ever had, I spotted a man. He looked to be in his mid 40s heavy set. And I immediately got a creepy vibe from him. As I was waiting for my ride, he was staring and eventually spoke to me. Do you have a boyfriend? No, I stupidly replied. Well, do you want one? While smiling at me as if I were a meal and he was starving. I was about to book it back to the store when my ride finally pulled up and I practically threw myself into the car and told them to floor it. My second encounter when I was actually working and was quite recent, perhaps a month or two ago. At this point, I've been working for over a year and have a pretty good handle on how to deal with customers. I've been here on before, asked out, had guys persistently asked for my number. So I'm no stranger to saying no, thank you. But this guy took it to a new level. First thing that weirded me out was that he had apparently been at the store standing outside by the trash can since first shift, which goes from 6am to 2pm. And it was now second shift 2pm to 10pm, which is the shift I work the most and he was still there. He looked to be around 35 to 40 ish. And even I would have had trouble standing in the same place for so long at around half his age. So I didn't really know what to make of it other than assume he was probably homeless and waiting for someone to give him their change or buy him food. Until I found out he was actually giving out money, mainly $1 bills and assorted change. This struck me as kind of odd, but I figured maybe he was just trying to make people happy. Then he walked into the store and was chatting at me as I was ringing him up, which isn't in itself unusual. Some customers will chat your ears off. Others will hardly say two words because they just want to get in and out and I'm fine either way. Then he starts talking about how I'm so pretty, calling me beautiful and the like. I have pretty low self esteem. So at first I kind of appreciated the compliment, but he was saying the same thing for a good five minutes. And I'm not the only female working here, yet he's focused on me. He finally exits, but I can see him lurking outside. I do my best to ignore him, but he eventually enters the store again. Someone buys him lunch and he hangs around chatting at me. Only this time it's insistently pestering me for my number and saying, why not? I'm a nice guy. I'll treat you well. When I politely refuse multiple times, he also offered me a bottle of Coke rather randomly. 
I don't even take unopened drinks from friends, let alone strangers. So I again refused, with a bit more steel in my voice. At this point, I was a bit worried about what he might do when my shift was over. Was he going to try and follow me home? Thankfully, my manager, after me sending him numerous help me looks, stepped in and kindly asked him to leave, saying we couldn't have someone loitering around the store. He finally left after that, and I haven't seen him since, but it seriously freaked me out. I'd like to hope he was a nice guy, but you never know. I work in a hospital, and I've had some experiences. Let me explain a little first about the setup on my work area. The office is between two exam rooms, meaning that the only way into the office is through one of the exam rooms, which is entirely senseless. But alas, I didn't design the place. That being said, if you're in one of the exam rooms and both doors out of the office are open, you can hear things going on in the other exam room. Also, both exam rooms have bathrooms. This is all relevant. I don't typically work super late, but I am there in the evening sometimes, and most of what I've experienced has happened when I'm alone. It's almost always in what I will call exam room one. I hear strange noises, constantly have the sensation of being watched or that I'm not alone in the room, and I see shadows with relative frequency even when I have co-workers with me, but only if I'm in the office and the door is open. Weird things have happened too, like doors closing on their own, not just a gradual closing, all of a sudden. Once a roll of medical tape rolled across the floor, things like that. But one instance in particular sticks out to me. One night while I was alone, I was with a patient in exam room two. When I'm alone, I usually leave the doors to the office open into both exam rooms because no one is going to use the other exam room and I need to hear if my phone is ringing in the office. I tend to favor room two and not just because of the seemingly hauntedness of exam room one. Weird stuff has happened in room two as well, just not nearly as much. Anyway, I was with a patient in room two and suddenly I heard these weird noises coming from room one, and they weren't subtle. They were kind of loud at first, I wasn't concerned, because whoever was making them wasn't trying to conceal their presence. So I assumed it was one of my co-workers from the overall department, but then it began to get disruptive. I realized that it seemed to be coming from the bathroom in room one, and it sounded like someone was in there banging around. I initially thought someone was, perhaps someone aggressively, using the bathroom, but there didn't appear to be any rhyme or reason to the noises. They sounded random. And it wasn't just like the sound of pipes, because A, we never heard that stuff, and B, it was so loud and constant. At first, I legitimately wondered if I were going crazy, but then my patient looked in that direction, clearly having heard it too. So I said, I'll be right back, and then stood up to go investigate. I walked into my office towards exam room one, and could clearly see that the door into the inside hallway was closed, meaning there was no way anyone could get out without me knowing, and I was still hearing the noises. I heard the noises until the moment I stepped over the threshold into room one, like the second I crossed over into the room, and then suddenly they stopped completely. I looked into the bathroom and thought the light was on. It had been off last I checked. It should be noted that the light is a motion sensor. No one was in there and I was seriously spooked, but I had to finish my exam. I don't know what that was, but we're going to ignore it, I said to the patient and then proceeded with the exam. I didn't tell my co-workers at first, but several months later, one of them told me of an experience they had and I was shocked because it was nearly identical to my own. The only differences was that the noises stopped on their own without her having to investigate, and it wasn't what she'd call aggressive unlike mine. But it was coming from the bathroom in exam room one. Her patient heard it as well, and it happened while she was working alone. 
We've had people pass in both rooms, so they could well be haunted, but who knows? Maybe there's a reasonable explanation for this. Or perhaps I'm working with phantoms. I was asleep for most of the day. I woke up at 1am and I realized while asleep, no one bought something to drink from the house. And I'm pretty sure the jug of water was all gone by this point. I decided to do what I usually do and go out to this one store that stays open even late at night. Now I usually try to avoid going there. So I try to avoid leaving too late to go outside to go get something if we really need it, mainly because the store sucks. And the fact I don't like being outside too late, even if I'm close or near my home, especially these streets. There's nothing wrong with my neighborhood. And it's quite safe actually. Just the five or six blocks between here and the block I have to turn to go down to get to the store. And my cousin who is staying with me until he gets back on his feet made me even more paranoid than I already am. He started talking about this woman going missing in our city and all this stuff. And that he actually saw a missing poster recently around here, which is rare to see as this neighborhood is quite safe. So I didn't really want to leave but knew I had to. I left the house and started walking to the store. and noticed this time there was zero people out, not even any cars coming by. As I mentioned, usually you would see some people out but not today, there was nothing. Just me. This put me on edge. I have a history of being followed because New York City can be like that. I always look back behind me. And when I'm walking, I always look behind me to confirm if a person is following me or not, and make a plan to be sure to evade them if necessary. I keep turning my head slightly to see through shadows and windows if something or someone was following me. Nothing and no one showed up. I did my usual and crossed the street on the third block and kept walking down the same path just on a different side of the road. I only do this because once I get to the fifth block, I have to be on that side of the road to turn the corner and walk down that block. As I said, I would turn around to check if someone has popped up and if they're following me. To my surprise, there's this black SUV slowly driving right behind me. I couldn't see who was inside. At first, I try not to let paranoia get the better of me and begin to rationalize the situation and thought this person was either looking for parking or was about to park due to the headlights that were pointed more in the direction of the sidewalk as if it was about to go and park right next to it. To be honest, that rationalization of it made no sense since the block was filled with cars parked and usually if a person can't find parking, they drive around and not slow down near a sidewalk. I kept looking back frequently to see what the person in the SUV was going to do. And the more I kept walking, the more I kept attempting to rationalize the situation. But that went out the window as the car kept going with no change of pace behind me onto a different block. And the only time it did change its pace was when I was starting to change my pace and walk faster. But it still went slow enough where you couldn't even hear it. My first thought was that if I couldn't run around and go back home, and I sure as hell can't find a police station around here to go into. If I'm being followed, obviously I should text someone and call them to talk to me just in case something happens. So I sent my location to the main people I spoke to my mom, my boyfriend and my friend and my dad. That was weird enough for her to detect that something was wrong. I kept looking behind me. And I guess I looked back enough where whoever was in the SUV noticed that I noticed them. And that's when they decided to speed up and go park at the beginning of the next block. The block I was literally about to cross the street into. They didn't even park fully into the block. There wasn't even enough space on that road. Their lights were still on and they were just waiting there idly. I stopped where I was and kept talking to my mum. Hell, I wasn't even really talking at this point. I was just trying to do anything to keep her on the line with me. My mum couldn't tell anything was wrong. 
and I stood there, not even really walking fast from where I was. If anything, I was slowly taking steps backwards. In that moment, I was making a choice, because the SUV was obviously not looking for parking. Best case scenario, whoever was inside was doing whatever they were doing, and didn't have anything to do with me. Worst case, they were planning to do something to me. Now, I didn't think the best case scenario was going on. I'm not dumb. And if it had nothing to do with me, they wouldn't have slowed down and lured behind me for a whole block. My mind went to worst case scenario, and I'm debating on slowly going back towards my house, where they wouldn't notice since I'm still behind them. That instantly went out the window, because something I learned is to never lead anyone back to your home if they're following you. And as I said, there's no police stations nor fire stations nearby. No one was around, no cars passing through. So I stood there and the SUV stayed right there. No one coming out or in. I didn't want to take the risk of walking onto the next block either. I'm guessing the person noticed I wasn't walking anymore and it fully registered into them that I saw them and they drove down to the end of the block to try and hide among the parked cars. It would have worked had I not moved a certain angle to see that they went and parked in a place I couldn't have seen them at if I'd have kept walking, which was around the corner at the end of the next block. And again, no one got out of the SUV. It stayed on and was just idling there. I still did not cross the road onto the next block. I did not continue my route to this store because that meant walking down the block and I wasn't risking anything to go pick something up. So I slowly took a few steps back, turned and went home due to the fact whoever was inside wouldn't have noticed if I turned around and left. I sprinted fast back to my house, kept looking behind me to see if the SUV had turned back around or noticed. Gladly, I made it back home and no one followed me. But I was shaken up and refused to test my luck to go out and buy stuff for the house, even if the SUV was long gone. I'd rather wait till morning so that I could see. Looking back, the SUV literally popped up out of nowhere. Considering the fact I always look behind me frequently, and I do not remember even seeing it anywhere parked or driving anywhere when I looked behind me before that, and didn't even hear it pull up either, makes me pretty sure whoever was there was more than likely trying to take me. I was actually planning on stopping looking behind me, as I saw no one prior, and I was going to walk and simultaneously watch a YouTube video. I actually was just walking and looking at my phone once I hit the third block. Had something not told me in my intuition to look behind me, I wouldn't have noticed the SUV and don't even want to imagine what would have happened because of that. I work night shift at a mental hospital. Obviously, countless people have passed here for various reasons. There are four floors, with the fourth floor being well known as a hotspot for paranormal activity. Me being security, I have to check in every once in a while. The fourth floor is essentially an extremely long hallway, approximately 1,800 steps, with housing units on both sides throughout. Each unit has a five inch thick steel door, and there's a window at the very end of the hall. They don't house patients due to the fact that the county took over a while before I started and it's completely empty by the time third shift rolls around. The fourth floor is also the only floor in the entire complex that is completely off the ground due to the complex being built into a hill, where the electroshock therapy took place a long time ago. This occurrence happened last week, Wednesday, on third shift. I wanted to do a walk through the fourth floor that night around 3am, for no other reason than feeling brave. I walk all the way down to the fourth floor to the window. Eventually, as I get closer, I started seeing that the window obviously needs cleaning. When I get about five feet away, all of a sudden, there was a handprint that would have been extremely noticeable even 15 feet away. I looked at the handprint, turned around, said no, nope, and walked back down the hall. On my way back from the window, I peek into a side office area with my flashlight to just look. Nothing. I kept going. After a few seconds, it sounded like someone was running up behind me. So I walked even faster because everything in my body said not to turn around. 
As I kept walking, I passed by a unit. As I passed, I heard what sounded like someone punching the door. I put it up as paranoia due to the running I heard prior. That is until I passed another unit. Another loud thud as if someone punched the door. So at this point, I start speed walking down the hall. And while I am, I hear footsteps following mine. Mind you, these units are not connected at all and the entire floor is empty. That's just one of my experiences. I've also been having dreams of a white skinny woman in a hospital gown that has black hair with bangs in her face. I always thought she was just a reoccurring person in my dreams until I talked with one of the CNAs that worked tonight in the kids unit. I never brought her up to the CNA. We were just talking about ghosts and she said that numerous people have said that they've seen the exact woman. I just explained. I explained to the CNA in detail about how she looks in my dreams. And she just went pale with her mouth hung open. Supposedly the ghost is extremely well known throughout the hospital by various people. They've seen her in mirrors, have been locked in bathrooms, and have seen her just walking around. But in my dreams, she always just appears or runs up to me, grabs me, and screams in my face. There was this one dream in particular where I woke up from a dream to wake up in my duplex stairway. I walk down the stairs because that's where my bedroom is, and walk into my bedroom. Once I'm in my bedroom, I see my fiance sleeping on her side of the bed and myself sleeping in front of my closet, which is on my side of the bed. I see the same woman standing next to my body just staring at me. I walk up to her and I get the courage to ask her who the hell she is. And she looks at me, grabs me and screams in my face, then shoves me onto my bed, which is when I officially wake up at 3.15. I have no clue who this woman is at all, but I still dream about her every now and then. Every single dream, is in a different place, but she's just there. And this has been going on since I started working at my job. In my youth in the 1980s, I had got my first job at a hotel in our town. It was a three minute walk from my house and was incredibly convenient. The manager who I had at the time was called Bruce. And he seemed very friendly. He was the kind of person that was very easy to work with. He wasn't overbearing, difficult, and just let you get on with everything. He'd occasionally come in to check, of course, as managers should, but for the most part would hardly ever complain and was happy with the job well done. I always got on well with him, despite the fact that we didn't speak often. To understand this story better, I need to explain that this hotel was rather large. It was a 13 story hotel and had a vast amount of rooms. The exact amount I can't remember. Well, this is when things got a bit weird. Bruce came into work one day and started acting a bit funny. He didn't check any of our jobs and just hid in the staff room and his office, trying to avoid anyone and everything. He looked really troubled and one of our coworkers went in to ask him what was wrong. And he gave them a very jittery response, saying that he just wasn't feeling well. And she asked why he didn't go home. He said it was a great idea and left. He hadn't come in for a week. He hadn't called any of the other managers and we were starting to get concerned. When they finally went to his house to see if he was okay. He came out and said he really wasn't feeling good and that he'd probably be out of work for another few weeks. This was odd, but because everyone liked Bruce, I suppose the managers higher up tolerated it because when he returned, everything was fine. He was back to his old self. And for the longest time, we just assumed this was a blip. I had been working at the hotel for over a year and a half now, and this weird Bruce incident had kind of been forgotten. When out of nowhere, it resurfaced. He came into work again in a really foul mood and just stayed in his office. After a few days of the same, he confided himself to his house. And as this was now the second time, people were starting to worry if there were some underlying issues 
underneath the facade of Bruce's bubbly nature and well-to-do character. After another inspection and Bruce coming back to work a few days later, everything seemed to be coming to normal. That is, of course, until the police came by when he wasn't working shift. They brought us a picture of Bruce and asked if he worked here, to which one of our staff team said he did. The police officer looked at them triumphantly and asked a bit more about their shift. He said that Bruce would be in tonight, around six, and that if he wanted to speak to him, that's when he'd have to come as he couldn't give out his address. I'm not sure if the police officer asked, but whatever. In any case, I was at work that time. And just as I had come downstairs to replenish some cleaning supplies, did I see Bruce talking with one of the police officers. His face was a ghostly white, super pale, and the most scared I think I'd ever seen him. They told him that he would need to come with them, and he begrudgingly got into the cop car, and we saw him no more. The next day, it came out that Bruce had been doing some shady activities, the likes of which I don't want to mention, but let's just say they were unsavory in nature and quite illegal. He had been caught, but was going to be put to trial. He managed to get out on bail and obviously wasn't gonna come back to work. I'm not sure of the formalities of the situation, but I think he was probably fired when everyone found out what he'd done. It was pretty sickening. But that's not where the story ends. I was working and it was around midnight. I was just preparing to leave when Bruce came in. I look at him and I say, Bruce, you're not supposed to be here. He ignores me and goes to the elevator and summons it to the top floor. Now it's important to note that we had these old style elevators in the building. He rose to the top floor, sent it down, and then opened the elevator door. He plummeted down the shaft and crashed to the bottom. I never actually heard any of this. The sound must have been quite resonating. But when all the commotion was happening around me, did I go and find out, and someone eventually clocked that something terrible had happened. It wasn't before long that the police, an ambulance came, and it was too late. He was gone. Let me tell you, it is no easy thing to retrieve a body from an elevator shaft, especially not when that body is in several pieces. I can't remember how long the elevator was closed off for, but it took a long time and a lot of money to get it working again. We might as well have just put a new one in, I think. In any case, that's not the end of the story. A few years later, I left my job and my hometown, got married and moved abroad. It wasn't for many, many years that I had a reason to go back to that hotel. My parents were finally selling the old place and moving into a retirement village to live out their golden days that was fairly near to our home in my new country of residence. So I was very excited. Unfortunately, they were gutting a lot of the place in order to make it sellable, as the buyer wanted it completely unfurnished and empty, as they had big plans to remodel it. My parents obliged and were helping with the whole process. So we were all staying at this hotel, which as I said, was very close to that house. I stayed there about a week, and just before going to bed, I heard weird noises coming from the elevator. I thought it was strange. And then one evening, I asked one of the members of the front desk if anything strange had happened in the hotel lately. I hadn't mentioned that I used to work here years ago, but the girl behind the counter was kind enough to tell me that even though I may not believe it, there have been numerous reports of a figure wandering around the corridors and mostly in the elevator. I asked if he was a stocky, tall man, quite strong. 
and she said, that's what I've been led to believe. I then told her about my experience when I worked there and about my manager who had taken his own life in that way. She was horrified. I'm not sure if this is the reason the hotel is haunted, but if it is, Bruce hasn't found his peace, and after what he did, I don't think he ever will. Long ago, I lived with my family in a government quarter behind the hospital in a town just south of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Being the restless teenager, I cycled everywhere, every time I could leave the house. Sometimes I would go to the hospital compound to visit a small coffee shop, which sold my favorite sweets. I would also grab a drink and enjoy it there to replenish my energy before more cycling. Beside the shop stood a small shrine dedicated to one of the Hindu deities, Ganesh with the elephant head. At the time, the shrine looked new. I was there buying some sweets when they had a puja, a consecration ceremony for the newly installed statue of the deity. That was when I learned that the shop owner's son was the one who built the shrine. He was an orderly at the hospital, a pleasant looking man who I'd sometimes see helping out at the shop. One day I heard a man ask the son why he built the shrine, since it's the son's story, which I will tell from his perspective. I'm going to try and make this as accurate as possible. From the son's perspective, a year ago I was working late, so I came to help my father close up for the night. After my father left for home, I stayed behind to finish up some paperwork. It was almost midnight when I locked up and started to walk down the walkway past the morgue to the exit. In front of the morgue, I came across a young man who was crying unconsolably. This was not unusual at the hospital. I asked the man if he was okay and if he needed some help. The man turned to me and said, They must hate me, Anne. Anne is Tamil for big brother, and also a term of respect that we, regardless of race, use to address an older Indian man. Why do you say that? I've been here since last night and no one has come for me, said the young man, who I think must have been Malay or Chinese. Don't be like that. Maybe they're on their way. I'm sure they'll be here tomorrow. Trust me, I said. And the man calmed down a little. Thank you, he said, as he lifted his head and smiled. I'll never forget that face and smile. So I left him and went back. He waved and I waved back. The next day, a family came to claim their son's remains. They came from clear across the country and back then the roads were not as good as they are today. So it took them a while to arrive. They told us that their son who was studying at a university nearby had been involved in a railroad collision and had died. When they received the news, they were at their farm, which was far in the interior that made the journey take very long. The medical officer instructed me to check the identity of the remains in the morgue. I took a member of the family with me and we headed to the morgue. When I pulled away the shroud to reveal the face of the body, it struck me that this was the young man who I had spoken to the night before. Half his face was gone, but I knew it was him. I could still recognize him. His father verified that this was indeed his son and then cried. I led him out to where his family was waiting. Then I left them and came back to the morgue to finish up my job. You don't need to be sad. Your family's here. They love you very much. I'll get you ready, then you can go home. I said to the body. I looked away from the face to check the tag against the paperwork on my clipboard. When I saw the face again, I was about to cover it with a shroud and I could have sworn that it smiled a little. The next day I asked for permission to build this shrine so that perhaps the spirits from the morgue will not wander around this place at night. This was many years ago. The shop, the shrine, the morgue, and a couple of the buildings nearby are now gone. In their place now stand multi-story buildings. In one of the buildings, not far from where the old morgue was, you'll find the new morgue. I live in a small college town, 
that was considered the most dangerous city in America per capita, not so long ago. There's a whole load of gang violence, drug use and a ton of awful people. I hate this town. I struggle with clinical depression. And recently after a long time of doing fairly well, it has hit me again like an express train. This day in particular was very bad. I woke up and immediately just felt horrible. My whole day was just a blur of moping at school. So I ended up skipping my tennis class final hour as it was raining, and I wouldn't be missing out on anything. Days like this, I can just tell my teacher I'm going to the library and just go home. I get home and immediately go on a walk without going inside. Going on walks and working out often makes me feel a lot better on days like this. I live about a mile from the college campus, so typically it's pretty safe. There's always police patrolling, and there are places where you can press a button in case of emergency everywhere on campus. I was just walking, and I get about halfway through the campus after strolling for about 30 minutes, and I decide to turn around and go home. I opt to take a different path home, and walk down the street where the off-campus apartments and frats are. After walking, getting about halfway back, I stop. I sit on one of the steps to one of the apartment buildings, and I was there for about 10 minutes just texting my friends and trying to cheer up, when I notice some idiot in a big black pickup with heavily tinted windows drive by very slowly. I thought this was weird, but I just brush it off, thinking it was someone looking for a certain apartment. But about 30 seconds later, I see him pass again. This time I give them a huge death stare because I was getting slightly paranoid. They proceeded to drive past, and I still haven't been able to make out their face. This happens twice more and I was getting a bit more freaked out. I didn't even look at my phone or call or text anyone because I was panicking, and I didn't want to take my eyes off the road. This time he proceeds to turn around right in front of me and pull up next to me. I'm 17, but I look like I'm 14, and the fact that my hair was wet didn't help. Without my hair being styled, I almost look like I have a bowl cut. They pull up directly next to me and park, with the passenger side next to me. At this moment, I'm freaking out, and I get up. I hear the door open and immediately bolt around the corner of the apartment building and hide. I sit behind a small bush next to the door of a neighboring apartment where I wouldn't be seen. I immediately proceed to call my girlfriend to no answer. I call my best friend, no answer. And I call my other close friend I met through my girlfriend and he picks up, which I was surprised about since he hardly ever answers. I couldn't call my mum because I know she would never let me go on walks again, but it's something I genuinely enjoy as it's very therapeutic. I tell them where I am and if something happens to call the cops immediately. My girlfriend calls and I tell them I'm going to talk to her. At this point, I proceed to quietly break down and tell her and make a plan if anything happens. After eight minutes, I walk out thinking they must have left, but I see the hood of his truck pulling out of the parking lot of the apartments I was originally at. So I stayed out of sight and ran back to where I was before and stayed for another 10 minutes, shaking. I finally get the nerves to get up. I quickly move to a public road and walk home, immensely paranoid the entire time. For days, I couldn't look at pickups without my heart racing. I'm over it now. But the guy in the pickup, let's never meet. I'm an Eagle Scout. Therefore, I've camped a lot in my lifetime. One of my favorite places to camp, however, is First Landing State Park, formerly known as Seashore State Park in Virginia Beach. The place is rich with lore, stories, and tales of the Native Americans who once inhabited there. There are many tales of the burial grounds on the hiking trail side of the park. The burial grounds have been fenced off and no one set foot in there for years, as according to legend, it may anger the spirits watching over it. One particular night, in one of my favorite sites at the park, a few friends and I were telling cliche ghost stories around the fire. It was a cool night, 
and it was extremely quiet, save for the cicadas. We decided to go on a walk to enjoy the darkness and maybe walk on the beach at about 1am. We started to see little dim lights flittering through the twisted trees there. We assumed them to be fireflies, but they grew more numerous as we walked on. So we decided to cross Shaw Drive to see the burial grounds. As we neared, the air grew cooler, but it had a welcoming sense to it. The glowing lights had all but disappeared by now, and we were eventually about 10 steps from the burial site and decided that was far enough. We paid our respects and thanked the Chesapeans for the stories they left behind. The walk back was quite cool, and it felt as though we were being pushed away from the trails. The Chesapeans and the Europeans didn't get along too well when Jamestown and various other settlements were founded, sadly. So, to the one who isn't of Chesapeake descent, the park is very unwelcoming at night. I have a few friends who are Cherokee, Leni Lenape, and Poatan descent and none of them have ever felt welcome in the park. They're always creeped out and want to leave once we arrive. I've seen figures walking around the park at night, typically wearing what looks like regalia. We've heard drums, chanting, and quiet footsteps in the middle of the night. I'd say it's frightening, but really it isn't. It's quite fascinating. Knowing that the spirits still roam their home is saddening though knowing they may see what it has become, how the land has been desecrated by the ignorant, and how it's been left to drunk college kids and crazy cub scouts. In a way, it's nice to know the law has been preserved by the state. Regardless, if you live in Virginia or anywhere near the Chesapeake Bay, I work at a small 48 bed hospital. These experiences happen in or near the decommissioned psych wing. IT, in which I work, was moved into this wing into old patient rooms. At first, I'd hear my name called, often from down the hall or from empty rooms. Thinking someone needed tech support, I would try to locate the caller, but there was never anyone there. Many times I'd see people in empty rooms, patients on a bed, doctors in white lab coats next to them. As this was a decommissioned wing, it made me turn around and investigate, only to find the rooms empty. Frequently, there was a male and female walking together, apparently talking to each other, and they would turn into the room next to mine. I'd follow them, only to find they had entered a room through a closed door with no one inside. It was always the same room too. One afternoon on a Saturday, I got called in while my four-year-old daughter and I were downstairs. I headed over but was unable to unlock the notoriously problematic back door to our wing. However, I saw a man coming down the hallway towards me, and I knocked on the door and motioned that I was locked out. He appeared to look right at me, but instead of coming to my aid, made a right hand turn into the office next to mine. I quickly leaned forward to better see and hurriedly knocked on the door, thinking he hadn't seen or heard me only to realize the door to the office was closed. Confused, I thought maybe I had seen a reflection in the window from behind me, and turned, asked my daughter if anyone had walked behind us, to which she denied. I was able to get the door open finally, and the office was empty. Another time, our wing was fully occupied due to a remodel which displaced some staff. I heard what I thought was a metal cart coming down the hall, and then a tremendous crash like a dozen pots and pans hitting the tile floor. I jumped up and ran into the hallway, partly to assist and partly to make sure no one was hurt. No one on our floor had heard anything. There was no cart and no disaster. Next, I was called in on New Year's Eve before midnight. The issue took about 20 minutes to resolve. And since I was going to miss the festivities anyway, I thought I would document my time and head home. Upon entering my office, I noticed the bathroom door was open several inches, which I always keep closed. This wasn't a big deal. Housekeeping had probably left it open while cleaning. For some reason, I did not close it as I normally would have during the day. As I typed up the incident, a man exited my bathroom. 
At first I thought perhaps my boss had come in to investigate as well, but then why would he be in my office? As I looked up at the man, just over six feet tall and thin, he looked over at me in shock, as I must have been doing to him, and then he disappeared. Considering the hour, I noped out of there without finishing my report. The old TVs in this room of the wing would sometimes turn on by themselves, just static as they had no feeds, but I had to unlock empty patient rooms and turn TVs off occasionally. With always, the volume turned up to the max. One other co-worker has told me he has heard his name called when no one is there, and seen a woman walking down the hall without the man, and the doctor by the bedside. Many people report hearing things they can't explain, but no one else has told me that they can see anything. The rest of the hospital has no abnormal activity that we know of. I work in an office in the Midwest. We have some cameras that are being set up. The whole setup is mainly in my office. This guy is one of those middle-aged men who likes to make a show out of everything, tossing used cables in the trash with a weird motion, trying very hard to get me to talk to him by making comments about what he's doing and the weather. He talks really loud on the phone, looking over to me and just smiling. I don't really engage because I don't want to. He's twice my age and I'm 26. He then starts talking about his daughter. Oh, you look so much like my daughter. She's older and lives with my ex-wife. You two could pass as sisters. Then he starts asking more direct questions, so I'm giving short answers. I'm not really being impolite, but I'm busy with work. Do you live round here? How do you like it? Do you like the job? I bet someone as pretty as you has a boyfriend. I wish I had a pretty girl like you to keep me company. Is your boyfriend older than you? Do you like older men? So now I'm creeped out because he's already told me I look like his underage daughter. And now he's flirting with me, leaning on my desk and asking what's the oldest guy I've ever been with. I told my boss and she's just like, he's making conversation. But it really wouldn't be a story if it just ended like that. And I wouldn't waste my time telling you all of this. The weirdo sends me a message on Facebook, asking if I wanted to hang out sometime, saying, I know you can't really talk since you're at work, so let's go out. I go by a shortened name that what's on my Facebook, but my business cards have my form name, which means he had to take my card to find me on social media. My manager is taking this seriously and called to tell the company we want another man to work on our equipment. Thankfully, I don't work there anymore. I am a hospital day shift worker, and I have been in my field for three years up until recently, and I've never experienced anything paranormal. I work in a critical care unit where many people have passed. Last week, I walked up to a piece of equipment and I was the only person in the room, aside from my sedated patient and one of the touchscreen buttons was physically tapped on. I heard the tap and watched it light up. I kind of stood there wondering what happened and then watched it essentially get tapped again and unselected what was selected before. Although I didn't actually hear a tap the second time, I got chills and had to leave the room. I brushed it off as a mechanical error or something like that. But just now, a week later, I was walking down the main hallway alone and heard from behind me someone whisper, Hey. I ignored it, thinking I was overhearing someone. Then I clearly heard someone whisper my name from behind me. So I turned around thinking it was a co-worker. I was alone. I've never had experiences before, and now all of a sudden, I am. It was Halloween night, and I was 11. My mum had taken me to my cousin Lucy's house to trick or treat, because a few kids from my school lived on her street. Also, her closeted gay friend was with her, but we would all joke that we thought they were dating. He had a girlfriend before, but I think this was before he knew he was gay. 
We were allowed to walk quite a distance from my cousin's house, probably further than most older kids would or should for that matter. We trick or treated for a while and decided to make our way to the local Tesco, which is a local supermarket, to get a pumpkin as they were usually cheapest on Halloween night. On our way, we noticed a grown man in normal clothes besides one of the extra gruesome Halloween masks made seemingly just so adults can scare kids. It was an incredibly mutilated and bloodied face. He was hiding amid some bushes, but it seemed like he wanted us to see him. I remember thinking it was weird because he definitely seemed old judging by his hands. So he wasn't just a teenager. I realized he seemed like one of these old sad dudes that get some perverse joy out of scaring little kids. When we had come out of the shop, we had a pumpkin each because they were so cheap. We saw the guy had moved to a closer bush and was tilting his head like something out of a horror movie. We laughed it off and walked back to Lucy's house. Just before we reached Lucy street, we stopped for some reason. I think we were laughing at a joke or something. And then as I was at the back of the group, I noticed the creepy guy was right behind us with his arms raised and then made an attempt to grab me. But I stepped back. Not too exaggerated to the point he was obviously joking, but to the point it wasn't entirely obvious whether he was playing a simple prank or was absolutely insane. I assumed since he'd followed us home, it was Lucy's dad, Ricky, with some fake old guy gloves. So I just turned around and said, Uncle Rick, as my friend bolted away, and I soon followed. We got to Lucy's house and told our parents and they seemed very concerned for some reason. A few years later, my dad told me that a guy on Lucy's street had been arrested before he moved there. So my dad and Rick threatened him that if he ever came near us, they would take care of him. I assume this was an empty threat. Although I do know how tough and protective dads can be. But I think that weirdo thought it was an empty threat too. I've always wondered if it was him and what would have happened to me and my friends. So creepy guy, let's not meet again. I work night shift on a trauma floor. I once had a patient that had been beaten with a baseball bat and required multiple surgeries. He was in his 30s and had visitors that kept lingering around a 60 something year old lady with a glass eye. Something about this lady just creeped me out, but there was something off about her. Around 10pm that night, the creepy lady said goodbye and left. Later on in the shift around 2am, I went into this man's room to clear his PCA pain pump and retime his vital sign machine. I didn't turn a light on as I didn't want to wake him. I'm in his room working on the machines for a solid five minutes when all of a sudden I feel a breath on the back of my neck. Then very quietly a voice whispers, I'm right behind you. I immediately scream out, Holy Jesus. The patient jumped up and turned his light on and there behind me was a creepy lady. She'd been in the room the whole time. She said that she was trying to make sure I knew she was in the room so I wouldn't be startled. She told us she couldn't sleep from worrying about him. So she came back to the hospital to stay the night. He didn't know she'd come back. None of the staff saw her return. There were no chairs or recliners in the room at the time. So she was just there in the dark, standing, watching him breathe. I live in an area of New York City, which is notorious for crime and gang violence and the sort. My parents are poor struggling Asian immigrants. So we had no choice to be living where we are. For context, I'm a 17 year old female. And even though my neighborhood is seemingly dangerous, I never truly internalized that idea. I've always been able to walk the two blocks away from the train station alone without an ounce of fear. I could walk slowly, freely and even listen to music as I walk home. Today, my carefree attitude came crashing down as I walked up the first block. I was listening to music before I met a strange man, clearly in his 30s. 
His hair was disheveled under his baseball cap, and he was wearing the stereotypical ghetto clothing. We were going in opposite directions, and as I passed him, he suddenly brushed his hand against my stomach as he hollered out, Hey, sexy. Immediately, I became hyper aware of my surroundings, confused as to why he touched me. I tried to ignore it, assuming he wouldn't follow me or anything, but I was wrong. He completely turned around and started lingering behind me. How are you? Can I take you home? I'm gonna make you mine tonight. I just kept walking faster, but he kept following me. As a 17 year old who's never experienced anything like this, I had no idea what to do. All I could think about was getting him away from me. Couldn't he tell I was a kid? As I took longer and longer strides in an attempt to get away from the creep, I thought of everything I could do. I would have to take a turn soon, and I knew that block would put me in more danger since it was usually empty. Thankfully, there was a grocery store near that turn, and a woman in her 20s who I made eye contact with. I walked up to her and gave her a look she could immediately tell by that something was bothering me. As soon as he saw me go up to that woman, he decided to stop and walk into the grocery store. I was still scared to take the turn, but the woman reassured me that she would watch him and told me to go safely. My legs were shaking from the experience and I am forever disillusioned with the safety of my neighborhood. How naive was I to think I would actually be safe on those streets? I hope to not meet again. Something weird happened to me while I was in a mental hospital in Amityville, New York, the same town of the Defoe murders of the 70s. Anyway, I was in this hospital called Brunswick Hospital for two weeks. And in those two weeks, I experienced scary stuff. Besides the fact that there were patients screaming and saying how much they want to end everyone in the unit. The first night there, I slept the whole day and night. Then in the day, I heard patients speaking about noises in the bathroom and stuff. That I mean, I didn't believe at first, since the unit was for kids. I was the oldest of the unit at 17. The second night, I started hearing stuff in the bathroom, like someone in there walking for 30 to 40 minutes straight. And it was weird because if you took more than 10 minutes, the staff would check on you. And I never heard the staff knocking the door or opening the door. I didn't pay mind to it, and I kept on sleeping. The three nights I went to the bathroom at three in the morning, I was having problem with my meds and I couldn't sleep. After I left the bathroom, I went to my room, and I swear to God, two minutes after I was out, I heard the sink going off and all the toilets going off at the same time. You best believe I didn't sleep that night. In the morning, I tried to speak to the staff about it, but they decided to ignore my questions. I didn't pay it any mind. I mean, it's a mental hospital. What else should I expect? Two days before I leave, I felt someone taking off my blankets and as soon as I wake up, there was nobody there. My roommate was sleeping and I knew it wasn't him. I woke him up and asked him if it were him or if something like that had ever happened to him. And he later told me he heard stuff too. Thankfully, I got to leave that place and never went back. I lived in a house that used to be a funeral home and the basement was obviously where the bodies would be prepared. You could tell just from the overall look of it and doing research on the house years later that it proved to be true. There were lots of graves in the backyard from children who died in the 1800s from an assortment of illnesses. Well, one night while staying up and playing some Crash Bandicoot, I heard a small child laughing at the top of their lungs and then run down the hallway. I was home alone and my sister was visiting a friend on the other side of town. I went downstairs and nothing. Everything was still locked up, no footprints in the snow, etc. A week goes by and my sister is sitting downstairs watching the telly and mentions seeing a boy wearing very odd style clothes standing on the stairs watching her before walking back up and disappearing. We'd also heard coughing from the basement, people walking around, and some of the creepiest was the doorbell ringing after we removed the batteries and ripped out the wires. 
Fast forward about 12 years later, and my sister has moved back into the house and tells me she still sees the little boy, but more frequently, and his appearances have been more unnerving. My mother used to live in a country town between Melbourne and Bendigo here in Australia. The town was known for its hot rods and back in the day gold mining. As there wasn't much in the way of jobs, she used to work as a cleaning lady for a few places, but she mostly worked at the same clinic every night for three hours. Most nights, she'd call me to pass the time. Eventually, I found out that weird things would happen to her while she was there on her own. As a bit of background, things always used to happen to her when she was younger, as my grandmother used to work as a medium. I do recall seeing things also as a child, but would block it out. I didn't want to believe I had seen anything, as I was always scared. My whole childhood scared. It didn't help that my very young parents would make me watch scary movies with them as entertainment, telling me when the scary bits come, close your eyes. They never did. And then they'd lock me in a room with the lights off and tell me monsters were coming for me. So sometimes she'd ask me to come and visit her and I'd make the three hour trip to her town and I'd help her with cleaning duties. Instead of three hours of cleaning, it'd be one and a half as we were two people, as I had finished vacuuming one room and moved on to the next. A big folder of documents fell off the shelf and there was no way it could have fallen on its own. It was tightly squeezed in there with other folders. Closed doors would suddenly open or close and I'm pretty damn scared at this point, but kept repeating in my head this one verse of the Bible. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom should I fear? By now we're finishing up, and I'm out the front by the automatic doors sweeping, when out of the corner of my eye I see someone walk past me, and just go inside. I turned to say the clinic was closed, but there was no one there. Just me and the open doors that closed, and I stood there, scared out of my mind. As you can imagine, that was the last time I helped her. I was a 13 year old girl, and an early bloomer, if you know what I mean. And I'm pretty tall for my age, so I looked older than I really was. Normally at the bus stop, when it was nice out, I would go to pick up my little brother from school, since I got out of school before he did, and it's about 20 houses down. I would always take my dog Caesar with me because he loved the attention and a good walk. I wouldn't say we lived in a good area, but by no means, it's horrible trash. Across the street from our bus stop is a blue house that had been listed on the sex offenders register. The people that lived there consisted of four white men that were the definition of white trash. Their ages ranged from 18 to 45. There was also an old lady who was in her 60s and 70s. She always had her grandsons over but he technically didn't live there, and she always drove these guys everywhere. One day I'm waiting at the bus stop with Caesar, while four of them were outside, two playing basketball, the oldest man sitting in a lawn chair drinking a beer, and smoking a cigar with one of the younger guys. I was on my phone, and being the protective person I am, carried a small weapon in my back pocket. This older man sets his beer down and puts out his cigar. He walks across the street to come close to me, and I discreetly backed up a little. I just thought he was waiting for the kid that visited the old lady every week. I think he is her grandson, but I really don't know. He comes closer to me and asks to pet my dog. At this point, my dog is starting to growl. I say sure because I was very awkward at this age, and try to get my dog to sit. But my dog is full on barking at this guy and won't stop. After a few minutes, I say sorry, he won't calm down, maybe later. And he looks at me for the first time, because he'd only been looking behind me the whole time. He smiles, and it was so creepy it sent chills down my spine. When I think about it now, he says it's alright, maybe next time you're here. He winks, walks away, and keeps clenching his fists, 
so hard his knuckles turn white. After he walks away, Caesar calms down a little, and he starts sniffing behind me. There are two huge trees and another row of houses behind me. He keeps pulling, so he sees a squirrel, which he only growls at, and then he starts barking at the tree. I walk him over to the actual bus stop, which is at the corner and he finally calms down. A few minutes later, I hear footsteps behind me, and I turn around and see the guy run out from behind one of the two big trees, and I immediately recognize him as the fourth guy from the house. Sadly, on November 7th, 2017, Caesar passed away at age five due to a cancerous tumor that spread to his lungs. I don't know what would have happened if my dog wasn't there to save me, but I'd rather not meet those creepy guys from across the street from my bus stop again.